Welcome back to Deep Learning. And today we want to talk about deep reinforcement learning. So I have a couple of slides for you. And of course, we want to build on the concepts that we've seen in reinforcement learning, but we talk about deep Q learning today. And one of the very well-known examples is the human control through deep reinforcement learning here in reference four. This was done by Google DeepMind and they showed a neural network is able to play Atari games. So the idea here is to directly learn the action value function using a deep network and the inputs are essentially the three subsequent video frames from the game and this is processed by a deep network and it produces the best next action. So the idea is now to use this deep reinforcement framework to learn the best next controller movements and they do convolutional layers for the frame processing and then fully connected layers for the final decision making. And here you see the main idea of the architecture. So there's these convolutional layers, relus, you have the input frames that are processed by these, then you go into fully connected layers and again fully connected layers and then you produce directly the output and you can see that in Atari games this is a very limited set. So you can either do no action, then there is uh, essentially eight directions, there's a fire button and there's the eight directions plus the fire button. So that's all of the different things that you can do, so it's a limited domain and you can then train your system with that. Well, it's a deep Q network that directly applies Q learning. The state of the game is essentially the current plus three previous frames as an image stack. So you have a rather fuzzy way of incorporating memory and state. Then you have 18 outputs that are associated with the different actions. And each output estimates the action for the given input. You ha don't have a label and a cost function, but you update with respect to maximize the future reward. There's a reward of plus one when the game score is increased and a reward of minus one when the game score is decreased. Otherwise it's zero. They use an epsilon greedy policy with epsilon decreasing to a low value during a training. And they use a semi-gradient form of the Q-learning to update the network weights W. And again, they use mini badges to accumulate the weight updates. So they have this target network and it's updated using the following rule. So you can see that this is very close to what we have seen in the previous video. So again, you have the weights and you update them with respect to the rewards. Now the problem is of course that this gamma and selection of the maximum Q function 
is a function of the weights again. So you somehow have a dependency of the maximization in there and the weights you're trying to update. So your target changes simultaneously with the weights that you want to learn. And this can actually lead to oscillations or divergence of your weights. So this is not very good. So they introduce a second target network and this after C steps they generate this by copying the weights of the action value network to a duplicate network and keep them fixed. So you use the output Q bar of the target network as a target to stabilize the previous maximization. So you don't use Q hat, the function that you're trying to learn, but you use the Q bar, which is the kind of fixed version that you use for a couple of iterations. Another trick they have been using is experience replay. And here the idea is to reduce the correlation between the updates. So after performing an action AT for the image stack and receiving the reward, you add this to the replay memory. And you accumulate experiences in this replay memory and then you update the network with samples drawn randomly from this memory instead of taking the most recent ones. And this way you kind of can stabilize and you're not too much focusing on one particular situation of the game, but you try to keep in mind all of the different situations of the game. And this removes the dependence on the current weights and increases the stability. So I have a small example for you. So this is the Atari breakout game. And you can see that the agent in the beginning is not performing very well. But if you train it over several iterations, you can see that the game is played better. So the system learns how to follow with the paddle the ball and then it is able to reflect it. And you can see that if you iterate and iterate, you could argue that at some point the reinforcement learning system also figures out the weaknesses of the game and in particular one situation where you can score really a large number of points is if you manage to bring the ball behind the bricks and then have them jump around there because it will be reflected by the boundaries and not by the paddle and it will generate a large score. So this is something that the office claim that the system has learned and found out to be a good strategy to try to aim kicking out only the bricks on the left hand side and then get the ball into the region behind the other bricks. What else? Well, of course, we need to talk about AlphaGo in this video and we want to look into some of the details how it's actually implemented. You already heard about this one. So it's from the paper Mastering the Game of Go with Deep Neural Networks and Tree Search. So we already discussed that Go is a much harder problem than chess because it really has a large number of possible moves and therewith also a large number of possible states that can potentially emerge. And you know, the idea is here that black plays against white for the control over the board. It has simple rules, but uh, extremely high number of possible moves and situations and to achieve the performance of human players was thought to be years away because of the high numerical complexity of the problem. So we could brute force chess but with Go people thought it would be impossible until we have 
much, much faster computers, order of magnitude faster computers, but they could show that they can really beat human Go experts with the system. So Go is a perfect information game. There is no hidden information and no chance. So theoretically, we could construct a full game tree and traverse it with min-max to find the best moves. But the problem is the high number of legal moves. So in chess, you have approximately 35. And in Go, there is like 250 different moves that you can do during the game. So also the game may involve many moves, so approximately 150. So this means that the exhaustive search is completely infeasible. Well, a search tree can of course be pruned if you have an accurate evaluation function. For chess, if you remember Deep Blue, this was already extremely complex and based on massive human input. For Go, in 2002, no simple yet reasonable evaluation will ever be found for Go was the state of the art. Well, in 2016 and 2017, AlphaGo beat Li Sedol and Ke Jie, two of the world's strongest players. So there is a way of solving this game. <laughs> There were several very good ideas in this paper, so it has been developed by Silver et al., also DeepMind, and it's a combination of multiple methods. They use, of course, deep neural networks, then they use Monte Carlo tree search, and they combine supervised learning and reinforcement learning. And first improvements compared to a full tree search was the Monte Carlo tree search, and they used the networks to support efficient search through this tree. So what's Monte Carlo tree search? Well, you expand your tree by looking into different possible future moves and you look into the moves that produce very valuable states and you expand on the valuable states over a couple of moves into the future. And then you also look at the value of these states. So you only look into a couple of valuable states and then expand over and over again for a couple of moves. And then you can find a situation where you probably have a much larger state value. So you try to look a bit into the future and follow moves that are likely produce a higher state value. So you start from the root node, which is the current state, and then you iteratively do that until you extend the search tree to find the best future state. So here's the algorithm. You start at the root, you traverse with the tree policy to a leaf node, and then you expand and you add one or more child nodes to the current leaf, probably the ones that have valuable states, and then you simulate from the current or the child node, the episodes with action according to your rollout policy. So you also need a policy in order to expand here. And then you can back up and propagate the receive backward reward through the tree. And this allows you to find future states that have a large state value. So you repeat that for a certain amount of time, then stop, and then you choose the action from the root node according to the accumulated statistics. And then in the next move, you have to start again with a new root node according to the action that actually your opponent has taken. So the tree policy guides in how far successful paths are used and how frequently they will be looked at. And this is a typical exploration exploitation trade-off. Well, the main problem here is, of course, that the normal Monte Carlo tree search is not accurate enough for Go. 
So the idea in AlphaGo was to control the tree expansion with a neural network to find promising actions and then improve the value estimation by a neural network. So this is more efficient in terms of extension and evaluation than the search of a tree and this means that you're better at Go. So how do they use the deep neural networks? They have three different networks. They have a policy network that suggests the next move in a leaf node for the extension. Then they have a value network. This looks at the current board situation and computes essentially the chances of winning. And then they have a rollout policy network that guides the rollout action selection. All of those networks are deep convolutional networks and the input is the current board position and additional pre-computed features. So here's the policy network. It had 13 convolutional layers, one output for each point in the Go board, then a huge database of human expert moves, 30 million that were available, and they start with supervised learning and train the networks to predict the next move in the human expert place. Then they train this network also with reinforcement learning by playing against older versions of the self. And then they have a reward for winning the game. Older versions, of course, avoid correlation in instability. If you look at the training time, there were three weeks on 50 GPUs for the supervised part and one day for the reinforcement learning. So actually quite a bit of supervised learning involved here, not so much reinforcement learning. There's the value network. This has uh, the same architecture as the policy network, but just one output node. And the goal is here to predict the probability of winning the game. They train again on self-play games of reinforcement learning and use Monte Carlo policy evaluation for 30 million positions from these games training time one week on 50 GPUs. Then they have the rollout policy network that could then be used to select the moves during rollout. Of course, here the problem is that the inference is comparatively high and the solution was to train a simpler linear network on a subset of the data that provides actions very quickly. So this led to a speed off of approximately a thousand compared to the policy network. So if you work with this roller policy network, then you have a slimmer network, but it's much faster. And so you can do more simulations and do collect more experience. So this is why they use this roller policy network. Now there was quite a bit of supervised learning involved here. So let's have a look at AlphaGo Zero. And now AlphaGo Zero doesn't need human play anymore. So the ideas here were that you then play solely with reinforcement learning and self-play. It had a simpler Monte Carlo tree search, no rollout policy. It was including the Monte Carlo tree search also in the self-play games. They also introduced multitask learning. So the policy and value network share the initial layers. And yeah, this then led to publication number three and the extensions are also able to play chess and shogi. So it's not just Go that you can solve with this, but you can also play chess and shogi at expert level. Okay, so this sums up what we've been doing in reinforcement learning. And of course, we look at many other things here. So next time in deep learning, we want to talk about algorithms that even don't have rewards. So complete unsupervised training. And we also want to learn how to benefit from adversaries. And we will see that there's a very cool concept out there that is called generative adversarial networks, which is able to generate all kinds of different images. Also a very cool concept that we'll talk about in one of the next videos. And then we look into extensions into performing image processing tasks. So we go more and more towards the applications. Well, some comprehensive questions. What is a policy? What are value functions? Explain the exploitation versus exploration dilemma and so on. 
And if you're interested in reinforcement learning, I can definitely recommend to have a look at this book, Reinforcement Learning from Richard Sutton. It's really a great book and you will learn in high detail about all the things that we could only scratch on in these videos. So you see that you can go much deeper into all of the details of reinforcement learning and also deep reinforcement learning. There's actually much more to say about this at this point, but we can only remain at this level for the time being. Well, I also brought you the link and I put also the link into the video description. So please enjoy this book, it's very good. And of course, we have plenty of further references, page one, page two, and of course, a lot of the things that we've been explaining here are shown in much more detail in the book by Sutton and Barto. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope you found that you can now understand, at least in a bit, what is happening in reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning, and what the main ideas are in order to perform learning of games. So thank you very much for watching this video and hope to see you in the next one. Bye bye.